I'd like to introduce Rachel D'Souza Siebert. Rachel is the founder and principal of Gladiator Consulting, a boutique consultancy with a holistic approach to nonprofit capacity building. Through Gladiator, Rachel has combined her knowledge of organizational culture and resource development with her deep personal commitment to centering community and seeking justice. In 2020, the St. Louis Business Journal honored Rachel in her diverse business leaders cohort. She volunteers with the AFP St. Louis, Lead Mo, and Nine Network. As a founding member of the Community-Centric Fundraising Speakers Bureau, Rachel has enjoyed sharing her work with fundraisers and nonprofit professionals across the country. Rachel, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am going to share my screen and I'm going to apologize in advance for the fact that my dog just walked in. So if we hear any whining or barking today, I have a assistant uh, for my presentation. <laughs> Okay, just wanna get a thumbs up that y'all can see my screen. Cool, thank you. Um, so Samantha gave you a little bit of uh, who I am. Um, I often also like to tell you all a little bit more about my identities before I get started. Um, so I am a mom and a partner. Um, I'm a friend and a sister and a daughter. Um, I am a survivor. I am a millennial, but I like the middle part. Um, I love my Peloton and Instagram and Grey's Anatomy. And I am an Enneagram eight wing seven. So I am a seeker of justice. I am so deeply intertwined in that passion that I used my personality to start a business um, that I have been running for the last uh, almost six years. So thank you for having me this morning. Um, as Samantha shared, our theme is Ripple. And when I started to think about this, um, I had to start at the beginning, right? What does it mean? What does this word look like? What does it feel like? What does it sound like? And as I sat with it for a little bit, there were five stories um, that came to mind for me in terms of what ripples have affected me and what ripples I have caused. So I'm going to share those five stories with you all this morning. So our first story starts about 500 years ago in India. Um, back in the 1500s, the Portuguese colonized the um, area of Goa on the southwestern coast of uh, the subcontinent of India. And that meant that the area of Goa became a very Catholic um, nation state. And it wasn't until the 1970s that India came back in and tried to free Goa from Portuguese control. Um, so that is sort of the story that my family grew up in. And when um, I was young, I often used to hear these stories about my great, great grandma, Mary, um, who in the late 1800s, early 1900s, um, had never gone to school and spent her whole life never having worn shoes. But she made a decision that all seven of her children would be educated. Um, and in that time, that was a really big deal, um, A, to make that decision that instead of having your children be part of the workforce for your family, that you would educate them, and B, that a woman would even get to have an opinion about what her children would do. Um, but that was what happened. And so um, all seven of her children went to college, um, including my gramps. Um, who did not wear shoes until the age of 30. Um, he finally, when he was 30, had to leave the villages and go work in the city. Um, and he was happy in India. But as it turned out, um, the woman that he loved, um, my step-grandma, had um, come to the United States when the United States opened its borders to Indian immigrants back in the 70s. So until the 1970s, there were pretty strict rules on um, how many Asian immigrants were able to come to the country. And even if they were able to come to the country, they were not able to access citizenship. So my step grandma came over um, in the 70s when it finally became legal for her to have a path to citizenship. 
my grandpa, um, my mom, and her two younger brothers went over to join her, and they started their life in St. Louis, Missouri, which I always wonder sort of how that happened. Like, there was a lot of places for y'all to go, and you wound up in St. Louis. Um, but so when they arrived in the 70s, um, the name of the game was Assimilation. And so um, though my grandpa and my parents spoke five languages when they were growing up, they stuck to speaking English um, here in this country. And so um, by the time that I was born um, in the early 80s and my brothers, we grew up in an English only speaking Catholic household, um, which was very different um, from what their upbringing in India had looked like, um, but made a lot of sense for the St. Louis County community that we were trying to assimilate into. So, um, if some of y'all on this call are from St. Louis, you will know that we are a very dichotomous community. We happen to think a lot in either or. We kind of have a hard time seeing how um, things can be both and. Um, so growing up, I knew that I wasn't black and I knew that I wasn't white, um, but I didn't really know where that put me. And it was a really strange space to be um, because my family of origin had a lot of cross racial and cross religious marriage. And so um, when we would have family holidays and celebrations, I would have French aunties and Jamaican aunties and white uncles and um, the food at my family celebrations are the best, just, just so you know. Um, all kinds of celebration. And it never occurred to me that there was something weird about that because it was my family. And then I would go out into the community, um, even as a little kid and see how separate we keep ourselves and how siloed we keep ourselves. And I remember thinking to myself, well, if I'm not gonna be black and I'm not gonna be white, I'm going to be this other thing over here, then maybe I have an opportunity to bring people together so they can feel the kind of love and joy that I feel when I'm sitting at my family's holiday table. And that's kind of the perspective that I had um, as a child, which I think is funny now because I wouldn't refer to myself as a peacemaker in any stretch of the imagination. Um, but growing up, I really wanted to figure out what is the way that we get people to listen to each other? What is the way that we figure out the fact that we all generally have the same goals in common. Um, we just maybe have different ways of getting there. And so when I was 17, I had the opportunity um, to go through a program called the Anytown Youth Leadership Institute, which is sponsored by an organization called the National Conference on Community and Justice. St. Louis has a branch, NCCJ St. Louis here. Welcome to look into them. But it's a week-long um, residential program. I, I thought of I thought I was going to camp, right? I was like, oh yeah, I'm gonna go to camp for a week when I'm 17. Um, and it was a week-long institute in which a bunch of people talk to a bunch of 17 year olds about systems of oppression, of racism, of sexism, of ableism, um, sort of all of these things. And that was the first time that this light bulb sort of went off in my head. Um, and it gave names to things that I had been feeling, but I didn't have language for. And so I decided um, that wh wherever I wound up, whatever I was gonna do with my life, I wanted to make sure that I was an active participant in dismantling some of these things um, that had started before my time, right? Um, slavery and racism and patriarchy and sexism have been around far longer than me um, and, and will be around far longer than me. But I wanted to figure out how to start to change the way that those systems show up in my corner of the community. So when I was 28, um, I think that I thought that my life was perfect. I had married my husband, Brian. We had a baby on the way. Um, I had a job that I loved working at Habitat for Humanity St. Louis. I did all the things that you're supposed to do and called it success. We owned a house. I had a job that I liked. Um, my husband and I were healthy, you know, Things that, things that we call success or things that we see and we think that looks like what success looks like. I think I thought I had that. 
And so on April 5th, 2011, our son Cameron was born. Um, he was breech, so I had to have a C-section. I was in the hospital for five days um, healing from that. Don't let anyone tell you that's not major surgery. It's major surgery. Um, and then I got to go home to start my life as a parent. And on the morning of April 13th, 2011, um, my husband had gotten up uh, while I was sleeping in between feedings and he made this cup of decaf coffee and these muffins from like one of those mixed boxes where it's like, put in an egg and some milk and here are muffins. Um, and he, he was like, I baked this morning. Um, and I got to have some breakfast um, while he held our son. And then he came back in the house and he was like, hey, do you think I could go to the gym this morning? And I was like, yeah, sure, ma'am. And I think he was really nervous about leaving me and baby home um, for the first time sort of by ourselves. And I was like, yeah, go. One of us needs to like brush their teeth and leave the house. Um, but I wanted to change out of my pajamas before he left. And so I went into the bathroom to brush my own teeth. And while I was brushing my teeth, um, this pain started and it started so quickly. It felt like someone had hit me in the back with a baseball bat. Um, and I remember turning around to see if something had fallen on me. And I looked in our linen closet, which, you know, is full of towels. And I like found that I was holding my breath and I was clutching um, the sink top because I, I couldn't breathe and I was in a lot of pain. And so I went and sat on the couch and I remember someone saying, if you're in pain, like switch positions. And I was doing all these things I've seen on TV. Like I put my head between my legs. And I was like, you know, laying. nothing, nothing changed the pain. Um, I had pain down the backs of my arms. It felt like somebody was pulling my triceps off of my arms. It felt like someone was stabbing me in the chest. Um, I felt like someone was stabbing me in the back. And I knew something was wrong, but I really didn't know what. And so I called my doctor and he thought I was having some complications from my C-section. And so he said that I had the opportunity to come out to the office or to go to the emergency room. And I, I was like, oh, you know, you will just come to your office. And then he let us know that he was practicing at a location that was about 45 minutes away from our house. And the thought of being in a car for 45 minutes in that amount of pain was not acceptable to me. So we made the decision to drive to the emergency room that was closest to our house. So we get to the hospital and I tell them that I'm having chest pain and I get put in a triage room in the ER where I stay for six hours. Um, I was asked a lot of questions about anxiety about being a mother, about drug use. I was not using any drugs. Um, people were trying to find a reason for the pain that I was experiencing. Um, I didn't have an answer, right? I didn't um, do anything to cause it. It just sort of started. And so about five hours in, um, my mother-in-law came to pick up our son and my mom, who's a nurse, came to the hospital and started yelling at people because that's how she gets things done. And I had um, somebody come in and do a scan of my heart. And as it turns out, my heart, the very bottom of it had stopped beating. And everybody realized that I was having a massive heart attack, that I had been having a massive heart attack for the last six hours. And they rushed me into emergency surgery. So I was awake. Um, while they placed two stents into my left anterior um, coronary descending artery to open up where the blockage was. Um, so they did that and it felt better the minute that they had put those stents in. Um, blood flow was restored to the bottom of my heart, to the rest of my body. Um, and I remember sort of thinking, whatever's happening is not that serious because I'm conscious and I'm awake and it's fine and I'm hungry and I haven't nursed and my boobs hurt and I, they just need to finish this so I can get on with being a mom. And they wheeled me out of the operating room. And in the time that I'd been in there, my entire family, my cousins, my friends, my brothers had driven home from college at Mizzou. 
or in the waiting room because what they've been told is that my chances of making it through that procedure were very slim. So I spent the night in the cardiac ICU um, away from my son. And the next morning I woke up to um, 26 or 27 medical professionals um, who had been up all night trying to figure out how a healthy 28 year old woman has a heart attack and survives it. It turns out that I had something called a spontaneous coronary artery dissection. So for some reasons we don't know yet, um, my cardiac artery dissected and caused a blood clot. So over the course of this next day, I get a long list of things that I have to change about my life because now I'm a heart attack survivor, about my diet, about the kinds of foods that I eat, about wine that I drink, um, about the kind of exercise that I'm supposed to have. Um, I'm supposed to find a way to live a stress-free lifestyle. I'm like, I am a parent and I work like that. There, there is no such thing. Um, and that I wasn't going to be able to have any more children. And I remember, um, they finally let me get out of bed. I wasn't allowed to get out of bed in the cardiac ICU for a couple days. Um, so when they finally let me out of bed, I was allowed to walk down the hallway and there had been like this really big rainstorm that year. And so it was like that aftermath of the rainstorm where the sky is kind of pink and blue and purple and cars were in like rush hour traffic and like the whole world had kept going and my world had just stopped. And all these people kept telling me how lucky I was to have survived and I felt anything but that. Um, in fact, I now being able to talk about it almost 10 years later, can tell you pretty clearly that that girl, she died that day. Whoever I was on April 13th, 2011, she died when I had a heart attack at the age of 28. And whoever came home was this new person trying to figure out how to live and exist in a world that had changed in a couple hours. So some years passed. Um, my husband and I had a lot of decisions to make about what we were going to do. And I remember telling him over and over again, I don't want you to do anything permanent because if I die, I want you to be able to have children with somebody else. And he was like, stop saying that. Like, I'm not planning for this. And I'm like, well, you should. Um, we had all these ideas of adopting and fostering, which is actually really complicated and hard. And um, for many, many reasons, um, we wound up being foster parents um, for a few years. And over the course of time, um, from the time my son was born, um, for the next three or four years, there were actually quite a few women that started to survive a spontaneous coronary artery dissection. And they got tired of their doctors telling them that they didn't know why or how these kinds of things happen. So they started to organize um, online and they started to crowdsource the information that they had about their experiences, about the medications that worked, about the symptoms they had or didn't have and took it to the Mayo Clinic. And instead of being driven by a medical grant or a research grant, the Mayo Clinic took up the case of these 26 patients, myself included, and started a huge research project to try to figure out why women who are pregnant and postpartum um, have heart attacks. And one of the things that has come out of that research is that a spontaneous coronary artery dissection is the leading cause of heart attack death for women under the age of 50. And we don't know that because we don't study it. We don't know that because in medical school, there are very specific things that are taught about who gets sick and why they get sick and what those factors are. But that research is based on men. It's not based on women. And so, um, you know, I think one of the ripples that has happened for me out of that experience is that I have to use my voice. I have to use things have happened to me and share them in hopes that um, 
it will impact somebody else. So, spoiler alert, I did not follow the rules. I took a little bit of a risk. Um, in the early winter, I guess, early beginning of 2013, the American Heart Association published a study in their journal of cardiovascular medicine that was that followed women who had had a SCAD of spontaneous coronary artery dissection um, and who went on to have a successful second pregnancy. Successful meaning nobody died. So the bar was low guys, the bar was real low. Um, and eight women chose it. Um, nobody died, but one of them did have a recurrence and one of them did have a miscarriage. And for some reason, I thought to myself, well, hey, six people did it. So if six people did it, I should be able to do it too. And um, despite sort of the urgings of my husband and my family and most of my doctors, I found a high-risk doctor who was willing to provide care. Um, and my husband and I decided to get pregnant. Um, it was one of the biggest risks I have ever taken with my own life. And it has proved to provide one of the best rewards and possibly one of the best ripples I have ever created in the world. Um, so my daughter, Amelia, um, I found out that I was pregnant with Amelia on the day that 18 year old Von Derrick Myers, um, a black teenager was shot and killed two blocks from my house by an off duty police officer. And I remember um, I was driving home from my parents' house. I had just told them and I was probably like five or six weeks and I get to my neighborhood and there are, there's police tape and there's people gathered and I don't know what's going on. And I roll down my window to talk to someone jogging by and all this guy said to me was some kid got shot. And so I make it back to the house. My husband is traveling. Um, I put my son to bed and I'm, you know, watching the protests and the demonstrations on my phone that are happening, you know, a block away from my house thinking, why did, why did I think it was a good idea to bring another person into the world, like into this world right now where black and brown people are harmed every day, all the time. Um, but it was true, it happened. And so when I think about, um, the things that happened to me in that sort of period of time from when I was 28 to when I was 33 and I was pregnant with my daughter, I came across this article called The Choice You Have to Make When Things Go Wrong by Martha Beck. Um, I think it was published in the Oprah magazine. It was published in the Huffington Post, so you can Google it. But it talks about the term um, Felix culpa, which is Latin for happy fault, and that when anything happens in our life, we have the opportunity to see it as terrible, to sit in it, to let it destroy us, or we have the opportunity to take it and to grow and to influence and to change the way that we see the world. Um, and I'm not gonna tell you that that path was easy. Um, it sucked a lot of days. There was a lot of anger. There was a lot of tears. There has been a lot of therapy. I am, I am therapy's number one fan. Um, but there are a lot of tools that um, give us what we need to be able to take something terrible that has happened to us and turn it into something wonderful. So the summer that my daughter was born, um, there was not a single doctor that was going to let me um, go back to work anytime soon. And so I had planned to take the six month maternity leave um, and be a mom for six months. And, um, go back to work, you know, in the new year. And that lasted for seven weeks. Let me tell you, uh, the summer of 2015, my boss was ousted from the organization that I had been working for, the nonprofit that I was at. And my husband got a huge promotion and went from being the, manage the manager for a seven state territory to being the manager of North America. So all of a sudden, um, I found myself as the stay-at-home mom of a four-year-old and a newborn with a traveling spouse. And the one other person who was in my life the most, my boss, um, had been removed from her job. And so I 
quit my job. If that's the thing you can do on maternity leave, I quit my job. And I thought, okay, like, this is life. This is what it's going to be. Like I said, that lasted for seven weeks. And in July of 2015, I remember sitting in my house looking at my messy children and thinking I'm, I'm going to be that mom on the news who like took her children to the bar and just got hammered and is like singing karaoke with her newborn. Like that's going to be me. Like this is an untenable, intolerable situation. Um, and since my husband was traveling that week, I called my brother um, to come over and hang out with me. And he is a CPA and he was like, why don't you just start a business? And I thought about it for a little bit. Um, but I never thought about it seriously because like, I am not an entrepreneur. When I think about entrepreneurship, I think about like man buns and wearing sweatshirts to give important presentations and trying to like exit the market and like Bitcoin and all these things that I'm like, that is not me. I don't know what that is. Um, but that night, those words and him saying, what's the worst thing that could happen um, was enough for me. And so I thought, okay, maybe I will start consulting and I'll do that for six months and then I'll go find a real job. Then I'll go back and I'll work for an organization and I'll, you know, finish, finish this little vacation I have from work. And so I had the opportunity to reconnect with a lot of different nonprofit organizations um, that I admired, that I supported, um, but I, you know, had the opportunity to use my skills and talents in their direction. And I started to find out something interesting. Um, the sector, every organization suffers from the same sort of scarcity mindset and silos and too much ego and too much fear of mission drift um, and too much worry about appeasing the people that are perceived to have power and resources um, and influence and, and very little uh, focus on, on the actual mission and vision of the organization or taking cues from the people we seek to serve. Um, and that really stuck with me um, for a little bit. And I realized that I had the opportunity to create my business around the idea of doing work differently, of bringing community into conversations, of getting out of the way, of partnering with other institutions with different um, talents. And so um, Gladiator Consulting has evolved into this sort of small business boutique consultancy that um, that has challenged the status quo and that has created opportunities for the various stakeholders in the nonprofit sector to um, think about the ways in which we don't use our resources to the highest benefit, to think about the ways in which power and influence have actually held us back from achieving a goal and maintain harm reduction or the idea of harm reduction in the work that we do. Um, and how, honestly, philanthropy, the way that it has happened in the United States has been fairly racist and patriarchal. Um, and if we are ultimately going to change the conditions of our community for everybody that lives and works here, what does it look like um, for us to start to think about and do this work differently? And so I had the opportunity um, in my role to do a lot of fun things, um, two of them. One of them is the St. Louis Racial Equity Summit, um, which first launched in 2019. It's the first summit of its kind. We are doing it again um, this August, uh, August 4th through 6th. And I'm really excited to be a part of a conversation to bring people together, to give everybody a voice and a space in this movement and to figure out how we can create a St. Louis uh, by 2039, which is one generation uh, after the death of Michael Brown, um, where racial equity is actually a reality in some parts of our community. Also the opportunity to chair the Association of Fundraising Professionals um, National Philanthropy Day celebration last year. And for the last 40 years, uh, this is an event that has celebrated pretty traditional philanthropy, um, corporate funders, um, white funders, white Christian funders, white Christian heterosexual landowning funders. Um, and while I do not um, throw any shade at their generosity at all, um, the way that we thought about who is generous um, really left out a bunch of different people who are doing catalytic work in our community. 
And so when we saw um, the opportunity in 2020 that COVID and ongoing racism presented to change the conversation, um, I did that. And so instead of celebrating people who have lots of money and give some of it away, we celebrated people who have thrown their whole selves, all of their energy, all of the talent and time and skill in their heads um, into figuring out how to care for and protect the other people um, and the other lives living and thriving in this community. Um, I can't even sort of begin to describe to you thinking about how my ripple began with a woman 150 years ago who thought it was important for her kids to go to school, um, that my parents left one colonized country for another colonized country because they thought that the opportunities would appear would be better, that there are pieces of my heritage that I've lost in the process of, of assimilation, but that in this community, I was able to find a new voice and a new way forward um, for me and for my children and for the work that I wanna do and for the dreams that I have. And I always think about um, this Brené Brown quote, which I don't wanna be hokey, I'm not like self-helpy generally, but um, this is something that sticks with me. And I think for me, this is like where the ripples happen. Um, I do wanna be brave. I do wanna fall on my face. I do want to get my ass kicked because when all of those things have happened, better things have come from them. Um, so I want to continue to live a life that is full of ripples and those ripples are going to be good and bad and big and small um, and meaningful and meaningless. Um, but as long as I'm telling my own story and living my own story, um, I believe that those ripples will matter to somebody else. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. I am very inspired <laughs> and I hope everyone else is too. I think that your story is so impactful. You picked so many pinnacle moments that have shaped your identity, but they also all had some sort of like change or decision that you made in that moment. and. I kept, I was writing notes and the reoccurring theme was you weren't going to accept that you couldn't create positive change or make a tough situation, um, turn it into a good one. And so I think that that's so inspiring because the one quote by Martha Beck, I think people forget that they can choose mm -hmm. to see the better side of a situation and instead, you know, they kind of just think this feeling of hopelessness is something that I have to subject to because that's how I feel, but it really is a choice. And you have consistently made the choice to turn your situation around or challenge the status quo or have another baby. And it's very inspiring. So thank you for sharing. Thank you. I want to open it up to the audience. Um, is, if anyone has a question, please type it into the chat, turn your cameras on, say hi to Rachel, share some love. Um, even if you don't have a question, you just have a comment. We'd love to, to hear from you. Yeah. I mean, I'm also very curious about other ripples or where this has resonated in the decisions or choices you've made in your own lives. Also, I have my camera on, so you should turn your camera on too. <laughs> we wanna see your beautiful faces. <laughs> um, I, hi, Elizabeth. <laughs> I have a couple questions written down while we're waiting. Um, so you had talked about, you know, that moment after your heart attack where um, you kind of were feeling very down and you knew the person that you were previously had died and now you are this new person. And after that moment, you chose, you know, to have some tests done, studies done, choose to get pregnant again. Do you think the old Rachel would have made that same choice? No, no. I don't think, I don't think so. Um, I think that 
I think that the world was more black and white for old Rachel. Um, there was more, this is good or this is bad. I think there was a lot of either or thinking there. And I think that um, in the scenario of, you know, what my husband and I faced when we were making decisions about having another child about me getting pregnant, um, she would have been like, nope. And, and, and would have lived with the like uncertainty and that just feels like a really miserable way to exist. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Kind yeah. of always wondering what if. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's interesting. Um, Cause it kind of pushed you into this new frame of, you know, new framework, new mindset of taking chances and living your fullest life. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'll say after my daughter was born, I like, I was like, take my tubes. I'm not using these anymore. Like, that was, that was the risk. Like, I'm not, you know, going to go down another path. But I think the other thing that sticks out to me is like, when I've taken a risk, sometimes it turns out really great. And sometimes I've fallen on my face. But I often hear this term, like, you've survived 100% of your worst days. And I'm like, yes, that is real. Like, taking a risk or doing something uncomfortable didn't kill me maybe it was uncomfortable. Maybe I'm embarrassed. Maybe I feel shame. Maybe there are some other things that I have to do, but I learned something and I'm still standing. And now I get to use that. I get to be able to say that I walked through that mess and I'm on the other side of it. And so try it, like try the thing, do the thing, fall on your face, let it hurt. And then like, do it again. I mean, it's the same conversation I have with my kids that I like sometimes have with my clients. <laughs> like we have to keep trying, like, who are we if we give up because it didn't work the first or second or 100th time. Um, that's not to say that that isn't exhausting and that some days are awful. Like some days are awful. Um, but the failures make some of those other days really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I believe in failing fast, getting back up, Mm -hmm. going after it, maybe changing your method, but totally agree. Yeah. <clears throat> um, you mentioned your racial equity conference, and I didn't know if there was any more information that we could share to our audience on how they could find out more. Yeah. Um, so I believe that there is a website up now, which is either racial equity STL or STL racial equity. I can't remember one of those. Um, but so you can sign up there for more information. Um, but the conference is going to be August 4th, 5th, and 6th. Um, the hosting organizations are the United Way of Greater St. Louis, Ford through Ferguson, Focus St. Louis, um, the Clark Fox Policy Institute at Washington University, um, and the St. Louis Community Foundation. So this is a collaboration of entities on all sides of the nonprofit and philanthropic sector that are coming together to offer this. Um, it is open to anyone. It is gonna be virtual this year. Um, I will tell you guys something that's not gonna be public till next week, but I'll tell you anyway, and that'll be fine. Um, but we have lined up four keynote speakers, um, Angela Davis, Edgar Villanueva, Adrian Murray Brown, whose book Emergent Strategy, I saw on your book list that you showed at the beginning of the presentation. Mm -hmm. um, and Shelly Tolchuk, the woman that wrote Witnessing Whiteness. Um, so it's gonna be incredible. It's gonna be a great opportunity to build awareness and understanding um, and figure out what your role is in this work um, in community for whatever experiences and identities you bring into the conversation. I think that's important, uh, the figuring out what your role is, because I think a lot of people have question marks <laughs> about that, you know, um, and I think everybody wants to be involved and do something, but where, where do you fit in, you know, so I, I, that's a great tool to, to share. Yeah, I think that's, um, I, that's sort of the number one place that people are like, I don't know where to start. Um, I think listening is a good place to start. But you know, even I, I married a white boy, and his role in the movement is to figure out how to raise brown kids. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't need him to go to a conference. I don't need him to, you know, do the stuff. 
he can do the job that he has picked. He can have his career. But what I need him to do in this work is figure out how to be the white dad to brown kids. And that's mm-hmm. his role, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we did share a link in the chat if anyone's curious um, to sign up for that conference. It's there for you. Um, another question I had, you were talking about um, you know, development, fundraising. I know you help a lot of nonprofits with this work. And has COVID changed any of your approaches? I, I feel like um, people are really scared to ask for money right now because there's a lot of struggle, but at the same time, I've seen enormous generosity and I'm wondering what your experience has been. Yeah. So, you know, I think the thing with COVID that is different than other crisis scenarios is that everybody has been impacted. So in the past, we've seen uh, an earthquake or a fire or, some sort of other disaster that like impacts everybody in a small community and we sort of funnel our resources there. And with this pandemic level crisis, the need was every was everywhere. And people that maybe traditionally would have saw themselves with resources um, all of a sudden found themselves without, right? And in need of the support they may have given. And so I think the thing that strikes me the most um, when I look at giving over the over the past year is that I do think that there was this reticence on the behalf of fundraisers to ask. Um, and, and I agree with that because people changed, right? And the agreements that donors may have had with nonprofits, those change too when circumstances are affecting you and your your life personally. And so there was a lot of work that needed to come before an ask, um, a check-in, a conversation, a what do you need, a coordination of resources, a connecting of people to other resources, and then maybe a like, how do you want to continue working with or supporting our organization? And if you're a fund development person and your goal is simply to raise dollars for your organization, doing all of those other pieces I mentioned didn't feel lucrative right? They didn't feel right. And so if you sort of weren't willing to do that work and you were simply asking, donors weren't giving last year. So when you start to look at the data from 2020, you have a rise in charitable donations. You have a rise in new donors giving to organizations they've never given to before, but retention rates plummeted. So organizations did not keep their donors from 2019 to 2020. And those donors then turned around and identified new organizations to give their funds to. Um, So I think now you have a situation where organizations that previously had no relationship with a funder now have an opportunity to build something new and ask people like, yes, you gave to us in a crisis moment, like how do we continue to keep you connected to this work? Um, and the biggest growth percentage wise that we've seen in donors in 2020 was from people that were giving gifts of $250 or less, which is interesting because it was the people who gave gifts of a thousand dollars or more who actually saw an increase in their assets in 2020, um, but had a smaller percentage increase in how they were giving. So, um, you know, when I, talk about our opportunity to reimagine resources. We often focus our energy on people we perceive to have a lot. And those people do have a lot, but they give away very little. And when we're able to create transformative relationships with people who give something that's meaningful to them, and if that meaningful gift is $10 or $5 or $100, like those are the people that are gonna be the ones that stick with your organization. And and that's a place that we have an opportunity to invest in relationships. Very interesting. You would, you would think the opposite, (laughs) but um, I've, I've watched a couple of, um, you know, conference videos or webinars, and I noticed that was something that they were saying as well. And a, a lot of crowdfunding and social media and, um, you know, just kind of marketing resources to raise awareness has really done wonders and kind of empowering 
more of the little guy to be a part of your mission than just going after people with a lot of resources. So, yeah. Um, and the other thing that we saw, which I think is amazing is the resurgence of mutual aid. So mutual aid is sort of sharing your resources outside of the ways that tax law confines a gift, right? So there are ways that our IRS code create a benefit to donors. When you engage in mutual aid, you are giving the resources that you have to another person who needs resources. Um, it is sharing, it is a more community mindset. As a donor, you don't get a tax benefit, but you are getting the opportunity to like build up your community. Um, so I hope that that's something that sticks around because to your point, it is a way to engage people who don't think of themselves as philanthropists in the actual work of philanthropy, which at its root means the love of humankind. Like how do we practice the love of humankind? And it's not getting a tax letter in January for what you did last year, right? It's something that is like far more transformative that has far more ripples, if you will, than that sort of exchange of resources. I love that change of thinking about um, who can be involved and what they can give. I think that's great. Mm -hmm. We need more of that. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, looks like Karen had a comment. Um, hi, Karen. <laughs> Did you want to talk to Rachel? <laughs> Oh, I'm thinking you're on mute. <laughs> no, I just wanted to say that um, I have a very similar upbringing in the Midwest, um, dealing with assimilation, and I'm just really inspired about how positive you are because it's um, there, especially you know in the past year. I think a lot has changed, and and mm -hmm. there's a lot to be hopeful yeah. for. Um, but just growing up, I I definitely did not have this positive attitude that you have. I've, I had this very sort of, um, at times resentful or being embarrassed of my parents. And, um, I just really appreciate you sharing your story. Yeah, no, thank you, Karen. And I, I mean, I remember like the embarrassment of like having to go to school with a bunch of white kids smelling like curry, like that is painful. Yeah. Like that was painful. And also I wouldn't trade my mom's cooking <laughs> or, or that, that smell of home for anything. Um, but it has also taken a long time for me to get to that point. Um, and so now I think the reason that I try to be positive about it is also because like, I have kids that, you know, when I was growing up, I was Indian, like they are Indian and they are Irish and they are German and they're sort of trying to figure out like, who am I when I have all these parts of me to celebrate? Um, and I, and I want them to celebrate the brown parts as much as they celebrate the white parts. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's not a competition, I know, but, um, but I totally, I totally get that feeling and that time just being like, Oh, my parents don't get it at all and feeling shame. And then um, trying to figure out how to like, feel comfort and feel a part of something. Um, so thank you for saying that. Yeah, thanks for sharing your experience. I think having more conversations and understanding is so powerful. Um, and I, I love Rachel, you, when you were talking about, you know, your childhood, I wrote down a note that you chose not to identify or put labels on yourself at a very young age. And I thought that that was a pretty um, mature thing to do, even though you, you probably didn't realize it at the time. But when you, when you were telling your story, it's something that I realized. I was like, she didn't want to identify or put labels on herself. She wanted to be multifaceted and not really put the dichotomy around these identities. And I think that's something that needs to be talked about more. Yeah, I've actually not ever thought about that that way. So thank you for that observation. Well, we have time for one more question. If anyone wants to type a question in the chat. Um, and if not, I have one more question. So what would you say to people who are looking to start their own new business? 
oh my God, do it, do it. <laughs> I, and, and I say that because, you know, five and a half years ago, there was, I didn't see myself as an entrepreneur. There's not a lot of entrepreneurial support for women, for brown women, for brown women who wanted to have their kids with them while they were working, right? There, none of that existed. And over the course of the last few years, um, with COVID, with CARES Act funding, with the push from Greater St. Louis Inc. about jobs, all of a sudden now our community is becoming so much more friendly to many different kinds of entrepreneurs um, doing many different kinds of activities and work. And so I'm kind of jealous because there's just so many resources and like startup capital and mentorship and allyship and peer circles and like all this stuff. And I'm like, oh, I was in my living room with a bottle of wine and a newborn and a laptop, like <laughs> trying to figure out how to set up my QuickBooks. Um, and now there's all these resources. Um, and, I, and it feels important because the other thing that, you know, I've been able to do is bring some of these values into my business. And that's a hard thing to do when you are working for somebody else or working under someone else's vision or working within the confines of, of what traditional work looks like. Um, and so you get to try things, you get to figure out what you're comfortable with. And then when you get to prove that they work, you can talk about them and hopefully bring other people along on your journey. So do it. I would be happy to talk to anybody about it. That's great advice. You made me think of something else that I'll share with everyone. Um, I was speaking with Susan Barrett of Barrett and Barrara Projects Exhibitions, um, which she's going to be a future speaker of ours, but she's going to have an exhibit soon specifically about motherhood. And a lot of it has to deal with uh, working moms and um, breaking down what that actually looks like and kind of redefining it. Because I think, you know, there is this like, patriarchy expectation of what that looks like and instead of what it actually is and what it should be and how women are have so much so many expectations around being a working mom and it sounds like it's going to be a really great exhibit so make sure you're on their email list um I'll try to put something in our email list too but um yeah that I like how when you're talking about entrepreneurship you're talking about the same things like Mm -hmm. It's not breaking it up into multiple identities. It's all happening at once. And we can recreate what that looks like in a healthy lifestyle in a healthy way. So, yeah, absolutely. I will add that to my cue. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you guys so much for joining. It's 930. So I'm going to do the closing. Please follow us on social medias. Um, Matt has posted the links in the chat if you guys want to see what's coming up next or uh, just follow along so you guys can know when our next event is. And we look forward to seeing you all next month. Thanks so much for joining. And thank you to Rachel. Thank you, everyone. Happy Friday.